Hi, this is Tom Sullivan uh, at Shikardi, and I'm here with uh, my colleague, uh, Andy Trask. And this is our, Andy, I'm excited to be here. This is our first uh, session in class action quick hits. And I'm it, excited it's to be great here. to be, uh, <laughs> it's, it's refreshing to be talking about something, Andy, that's a little bit different than the legal impact of COVID-19. Yes. Uh, and, the, and the case we're going to talk about today um, is Painters and Allied Trades District Council 82 Healthcare Fund et al. versus Takeda Pharmaceuticals uh, Company Limited uh, and uh, et al. And this, uh, Andy, this is an opinion that uh, of the Ninth Circuit that came down back in December, but I think it's got some issues in it that are still timely or are going to have uh, some interesting impact potentially on practice of class actions going forward. Um, and just to set the stage a little bit, um, this uh, is a is a case brought uh, by some 30 payers against Takeda. It arises in the context of litigation over claims regarding the drug Actos, which uh, was a part of a therapy for bladder cancer. And the essence of the allegations in this particular case are that Takeda uh, failed to disclose the uh, increased risks, alleged increased risks of bladder cancer from taking Actos. The plaintiffs, both the fund and the individual plaintiffs, that uh, are also uh, named plaintiffs and would not have purchased the drug had they known uh, of those risks. And this is the kind of litigation, the kind of claim class uh, type of case that you often see uh, brought in companion with, uh, or in the, the same context as a personal injury litigation over uh, a pharmaceutical drug um, and um, for that reason is, I think, significant to practitioners in this space. And Takeda moved to dismiss this uh, case at the district court level, um, and they moved to uh, dismiss on grounds that um, plaintiffs did not or could not uh, allege, uh, satisfy the required elements of RICO, um, and uh, particularly uh, could not uh, satisfy the by reason of requirement under the RICO stat statute because there was no uh, direct, there was a failure of proximate causation between uh, their alleged uh, failure to disclose and plaintiff's alleged financial injury. Uh, and uh, the real reason they argued that there, there was such a failure uh, relates to uh, the intervening uh, cause or lack of uh, causation uh, by virtue of uh, the learned intermediaries, that is the doctors who prescribe the drugs. And that attenuated chain of causation couldn't exist here uh, because the doctors and uh, in their judgment prescribed the drugs uh, and therefore stood, uh, severed the causal chain between the alleged misrepresentations or failure to uh, inform plaintiffs of the risks and their alleged injuries. The Ninth Circuit reversed uh, the decision of the district court um, and found that uh, the plaintiffs were able to allege a direct relation, were able to sufficiently allege uh, that uh, element of RICO because what they said is that, that what they argued the Ninth Circuit did is they rejected the defendant's position that the doctors were learned intermediaries that severed the causal chain and instead found that it was foreseeable that uh, it, the doctors would pass along uh, the information uh, about what they knew about act failure to disclose the risk. Um, 
And uh, in rejecting it, they, they created somewhat of a circuit split that Andy's going to talk about a little bit, uh, as well as uh, some of the implications here for uh, potential class litigation down the road. Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the theories here that, that I touched on uh, briefly between the plaintiffs and the defendants? Sure thing. Um, and these are the kinds of things you'll see not only in antitrust litigation um, and class litigation, but like Tom said, also you can see these in personal injury related class litigation or um, consumer class litigation with products liability. Um, essentially, the theories that the plaintiffs were pursuing were the kinds that can be done anytime you have an, an allegation of some kind of injury that you don't have to tie to or some kind of economic damage that you don't have to tie to a specific injury. So in this case, what the plaintiffs had said was that the third party payers had provided health and welfare benefits to the covered members, then reimbursed the claims for the drugs submitted by the pharmacies and providers. Um, and that meant that third party pro or providers had decided which drugs were covered under the plan. And that meant that when individual plaintiffs or patients who were paying out of pocket, they were paying for the third party payers um, or third party providers decisions um, so when Takeda allegedly concealed the safety risks of Actos, they deceived the third party providers, which in turn deceived the ultimate payers who would be the, the insureds in this case. Um, and therefore, the fact that the insurers would not have, not have bought Actos on their own had they been advised to the risks um, was caused by the original concealment that was done to the third party payors. Um, the idea being that, that that deception just went down the line from one intermediary to the next. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult theory. It's often, as Tom will point out in a bit, um, been rejected by courts as having a few too many steps with a few too many intermediaries who might know a bit too much. But for these plaintiffs' purposes, that was the theory that they pursued. What they then did was to allege that the damage came not from any individual overpayment, uh, because that would require tracing a chain of causation back, but from the general overcharge that one could derive by looking at the average cost overall. They call this the quantity effect theory. The idea being that if, um, if the third party payers were paying for what was presumably a safe drug, then they were already paying some sort of a premium for safety uh, that they would not have paid for an unsafe drug. Um, one can argue about whether or not one would pay for an unsafe drug at all. But the general idea here is that one would pay more for a drug that you knew to be safe than for one that had some degree of risk attached to it, and that one could quantify on an average basis what that degree of risk would look like. Um, there's going to be a question later on that we'll get into as to whether or not that means that you've established a damages theory that links up to your liability theory, which the Supreme Court requires for class actions. But this is what the plaintiffs went forward with at this point. Um, what the plaintiffs then did, of course, was to assert RICO charges, which is not uncommon in class actions, but is often done in specific circumstances. And Tom, why don't you tell us what those are? Sure. And uh, it, just briefly, I mean, it, the reason that these RICO claims tend to be so attractive, or there are a few reasons, I guess. One is uh, they afford the opportunity from the plaintiff's perspective for treble damages. There's a certain stigmatizing uh, effect of RICO claims, uh, maybe less so now, given how many there have been, especially in this particular context. And a couple of other reasons are that they allow now for, they allow for nationwide service of process, so you avoid some of the issues uh, with personal jurisdiction that might exist under Bristol-Myers. Uh, and they also offer the opportunity for plaintiffs to allege uh, conspiracy uh, claims under the statute. So these are definitely the types of cases that appeal to uh, plaintiff's class action lawyers in this space. And in this case, uh, the, the Ninth Circuit addressed a line of Supreme Court cases uh, that we mentioned briefly at the outset uh, that dealt with what proximate cause means and the requirement of proximate cause under the RICO statute. Uh, and this, the Ninth Circuit in this case found that the plaintiffs were able to sufficiently allege or could allege that 
uh, Takeda here um, that, that the, 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 the by reason of requirement in the statute was satisfied under these circumstances. And this creates a bit of a circuit split uh, that Andy uh, is going to address. When Tom says a bit of a circuit split, he's understating slightly. This may be one of the clearest circuit splits um, that the Ninth Circuit has created in some time. And in fact, the certiorari petition that went up about two months ago um, to the Supreme Court, specifically on this case, outlined the two circuit splits in part by just quoting the Ninth Circuit opinion, because the Ninth Circuit itself said, we recognize that we are disagreeing with several other circuits here. Um, so there are actually two issues involved in the circuit split. The first of these is exactly how much proximate causation or exactly how attenuated causation can be and still be proximate cause. Um, the Ninth Circuit itself actually had, disagrees with what the Ninth Circuit used to say, which is that once you had um, once you had too many independent links from one intermediary to another, you were no longer in the realm of proximate cause. Um, so this 2010 Ninth Circuit opinion, for example, uh, dismissed a complaint or affirmed the dismissal of a complaint for failure to prove, it or prove causation or alleged causation when the theory relied on at least four independent links. Um, in this case, we've got three as opposed to four, but still, that's quite a bit. Um, it also just uh, the circuit also back in 1999 had affirmed dismissal of a RICO claim that a plan had suffered higher expenditures because of medical bills for participant smokers back in the days when we used to try to have class actions over smoking. Um, and that once again is a, a fairly it's not even as attenuated as this particular case, but it's another instance where the Ninth Circuit had decided that was too far apart. Um, the Seventh Circuit and the Second Circuit have also weighed in and said that if you're too many levels removed on your proximate causation inquiry, then you have an alleged proximate causation in such a way that you can allege a valid tort claim. Um, on the other side, uh, for this particular circuit split, are the First Circuit and the Third Circuit, both of which at this point have rejected the too many steps argument, the idea being that once you've got one or two steps, even if you're out from the initial payor, if there's a logical link, and here I think the Ninth Circuit would argue that um, the defendant pharmaceutical companies knew what the prescribing doctors would say, and therefore, once they had an idea of how they'd influence that, they had caused the next step down. Um, and that comes up in the Ninth Circuit's language that were we to rule the other way, then pharmaceutical companies could simply hide behind prescribing doctors. Uh, this clashes quite a bit with the intermediate or the learned intermediary theory, uh, which assumes that doctors are independent thinkers and therefore are not necessarily just going to push a party line. Uh, but that's the that's the place where at least it's been decided that there was sufficient allegation uh, that this would work as a theory. I think there's still an opportunity, however, to challenge actual causation as one goes through. Um, the other, by the way, although we don't have it highlighted um, in slide, the other inquiry that created a circuit split here was exactly what the damages inquiry could be and whether or not that violates Comcast. And that, once again, was a split among several circuits. Um, and so it's interesting, the briefing that was filed, both the amicus briefing, but also the initial briefing up to the Supreme Court um, was very brief. Would, briefing was very brief. The briefing was relatively concise. And the concision came from the fact that really all you had to do was to point out one or two major holdings from each circuit. And the split becomes incredibly clear in this case. Um, that said, the Ninth Circuit went ahead and gave its rationale for denying a dismissal in this case. And Tom, why don't you talk about that? Sure. So it, the, the Ninth Circuit, as, as we hinted at the outset, um, rejected the district court's holding, and it rejected it primarily on the grounds that uh, the decisions of the prescribing uh, physicians and pharmacy benefit managers did not constitute intervening uh, causes that severed the chain of proximate causation between uh, Takeda and the third-party payers. And the reason is, the court said, is that the manufacturer could foresee that the physicians who prescribe Actos would play just the type of role uh, that they did uh, in making their prescribing their prescribing decisions. And the court articulated some concern that if it upheld the decision of the district court, this would allow pharmaceutical manufacturers to hide behind the decisions of the prescribing physicians and avoid liability. 
Um, so it rejected it uh, for the doctrinal reasons that uh, Andy's talked about, and there is also an element of a, a policy rationale that motivated the decision. Um, and um, those are the reasons that it rejected the, the holding of the district court. Uh, we should note, too, uh, importantly, that this case not involve alleged off-label uh, marketing of Actos. Um, if it did, the, 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 the Ninth Circuit suggests may, the analysis maybe would have gone another way. Um, but in any event, that's an important distinguishing factor between this and cases that of off-label marketing. Um, and... You know, although uh, the Ninth Circuit has ruled against the defendants here, this is obviously the first step in what's likely to be a lengthy bit of litigation, and uh, the, the the class action consequences of this decision will, I think, continue to play out uh, through the litigation. And Andy, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So we've lost the most important defendant. Um, but that doesn't mean that the case is over. And in this particular case, given the theory that was allowed to proceed, it's entirely possible that this case will still get no further than class certification. Um, the primary reason for that is the case is premised on intentional misrepresentations about a specific risk of developing bladder cancer. That means that you actually have to determine whether or not this misrepresentation made it out to each of the intermediaries. Um, the idea here is that the plaintiffs have alleged that it made it out to at least their intermediaries, um, and they were therefore overcharged. But you're going to have to trace the chain of causation for each of these. In addition to that, if you do get anything else, I mean, that allows for a lot of actual discovery for the, the defendants to pursue, among other things, asking to talk to the plaintiff's doctors, asking what individualized facts about the plaintiffs might have recommended a prescription like this anyway, as opposed to some alternative drug. Um, so those are all still going to be in play, both for individualized summary judgment motions, which can then set up um, the second thing, which would be class certification opposition. In addition, though, the plaintiffs are going to have a tough time proving this of using class-wide proof. Um, statistical evidence and surveys aren't really allowed uh, in cases like this. For the most part, even under Bua Pakeo, the uh, Supreme Court case from 19, or 2016, the only time that you really allowed to use statistical evidence in place of individualized evidence is when a statute specifically allows it. Um, in that case, it was the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA. Um, but there are very few other statutes that do that kind of authorization. So RICO certainly doesn't. So with a RICO case here that's based primarily on strict liability and negligence theories, I think you're still going to see a, a need to look at individualized evidence. And that's going to be a real problem for the plaintiffs as they try to get to class certification. Um, so the key takeaways in this case are... Uh -huh. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you a question, but... <laughs> I was going to hand it off. One question I had... <laughs> Uh, a quick a, a question really for you to see if you agree with this, but uh, this touches with the damages issue. The court, the, the Ninth Circuit suggested um, that the plaintiffs may have a, a problem in establishing their damages to the extent that if they or if they can't establish that their that drugs other than Actos would have been cheaper uh, because right. this is a drug that patients take for bladder cancer. So the patients are going to have to take some drug uh, to uh, address their health issue. Um, so if not Actos, what? And is that alternative drug cheaper than Actos? The plaintiffs suggested that they had evidence that there are such alternatives that are cheaper, um, but whether there are may uh, create another evidentiary issue to the extent, you know, in terms of whether those therapies are on formularies or whether those there actually are cheaper. Right. And that's an incredibly individual question or individualized question. Um, as we all know from going to the doctor at this point, um, just because WebMD says one drug is the one that's probably most likely to help you out, it doesn't mean that your specific medical facts won't counsel, counsel some other diagnosis or some other prescription. So 
everybody's individual medical conditions at that point become incredibly relevant to the question of which drug they'd be prescribed otherwise, let alone whether that drug is cheaper, whether it's covered by their specific insurance, um, whether there are cost saving measures within that insurance. Some people do Optum RX, which is a mail order service, as opposed to popping down to the local CVS, um, even within an individual insurer. Um, and all of those are going to go directly to not just damages, but whether you were injured in the first place. Tom, would you like to take it home? Well, Sure. Well, this is Andy. This is definitely one to watch. Uh, definitely one to watch at the cert stage. And uh, you know, assuming that the case moves forward, I think there are going to be some important class issues uh, to take a look at. Um, opinion that, in the short term at least, is going to be helpful to plaintiffs' lawyers, especially plaintiffs' lawyers looking to bring RICO claims, um, but. I think this is also a fairly narrow factual context that can be uh, distinguished from a lot of other cases. Um, and for class action lawyers, if the case does move forward, I think it's important to note that the plaintiffs are going to have some significant hurdles at the class cert stage. I think that's right. Thanks a lot for inviting me to do this, Tom. And thank you, everybody at home, for bearing with us on our very first one of these. Great, Andy. Thanks so much.